Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPB-TV and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today, we are chatting with Susana Rivera Mills, Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at Ball State University. Susana has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and to thank you, Susana, for joining us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So being the provost at this university is quite a challenge. You have so many people to serve. You have a huge faculty. You have a, a community that really treasures the institution but also demands excellence from it. Talk about your decision to join this, this uh, university from Oregon and, and what prompted you to come here and what your experience has been like over the last year. You know, it has been uh, a wonderful experience, even though I have only been here for a short period of time. I can honestly say that I feel like I came and I hit the ground running and there was an enormous amount of information that I had to process quite quickly. What really drew me to Ball State was, first of all, the fact that we put students front and center. It was clear to me from the research that I had done, from what I had experienced during the interviews, that the student experience is what we're all about. And I mean that in the sense that, you know, our, our student faculty ratios are 17 to one. Our average class size is 23 students. And so students here, from the moment they come to Ball State, they're engaging with their faculty, with their professors, they are building relationships. And I really wanted to be at an institution that valued that educational experience from the very beginning. And Ball State plays an outsized role um, as a uh, community development organization, educational institution, and an institution that provides a platform for the future for its students. And particularly in this part of, of post-industrial Indiana that is searching for its next great thing, its next great economic launch pad, this university is the key. It, it holds the key to so many different things from what's happening in the, in the public schools to what's happening in the sciences to what's happening in workforce development. Absolutely, and I think that that was yet another thing that drew me to this institution. So first of all, as you look at the, the proud history of Ball State and how it was founded, from the very beginning, it's clear that community was right there supporting the foundation of the institution, that it was community, the Ball family, who realized the importance of bringing an institution of higher education to continue to advance the city in a number of ways. Uh, coming from Oregon and having been at a land-grant institution whose mission was also to serve community, I wanted to make sure that I would continue to be able to have that commitment. And even as we look at what we're doing presently with the Muncie Community School relationship that we have, uh, and also where we're headed in the future, we're seeing that community engagement be key. And I think you're absolutely right when you say that it's going to be through education and through numerous partnerships with the university, with community, with industry, that we're gonna be able to move ahead and reimagine what this city can be. So before you were a provost, you were academically engaged. Before you were academically engaged, you were a student. Before you were a student, you were a child. Talk about this trajectory of your life that yeah. resulted in you being the provost of this institution at this time. Where were you born, yeah. where did you grow up? So I was born in El Salvador, which is the smallest country in Central America. And I lived there. I think that the imagining that I would end up here was, could not have been further from my mind. Uh, but because of the Civil War at the time in the 80s, my family, like many others, had to immigrate, had to leave for safer place for us to grow up. The refugees. Absolutely. And so my family went to San Francisco because we had some family that had immigrated there previously during the 1940s. I was the first one in my family to learn English. We were one of five Latino families. This was before ESL and bilingual education were in the schools. And so it was really sink or swim for me. Uh, I learned English and my family, even though my parents never went to college, they always valued education and they encouraged us to do our best in education. In addition, I had two key teachers, one in junior high, eighth grade, my math teacher, Rudy Diaz, and one in high school, Lucy Quimby, who would talk to me in a way 
that was really transformative. And we all remember the names of, yes. of those key teachers. Absolutely. I mean, those are the relationships that are so influential. And what I specifically remember is Lucy saying to me, Susanna, when you go to college, what do you want to study? When you go to college. When, not if. When you go to college. The high expectations. Absolutely. So by the time I graduated high school, college wasn't a question mark in my mind. It was a destination. And then I went on to graduate school. And then my first position really was as a faculty member. And I was passionate about becoming a teacher because teachers had changed my life. So when the opportunity arose to go into administration as a department chair, department head, the thought that went through my mind is, I can either continue to try to solve these issues one at a time and really treating the symptoms, or I can begin to change the source of the problem. So it's going at the problem systemically. Now, if you were to uh, encapsulate the mission of an academic function at a university like this, how would you characterize that in, in, in the briefest form possible? We're here to help people achieve their dreams and live fulfilling, meaningful lives. So as, as, you're, as you're translating that into real credentials that your, that your academic staff uh, need to contribute, how those credentials enable young people to fulfill their dreams, to lead those meaningful lives, um, how do you ensure that, uh, you're, th that the culture that you're building is looking at that and is analyzing data in that sense and starting to think about what they have to do for themselves in their departments, in their conduct, in their teaching, in their continuing education. Absolutely. To, to fulfill that. It's, it is about continuous improvement. And I think that today, particularly, institutions of higher education are investing more and more in data. Data analytics, looking at big data, do, doing predictive analytics to make sure that we know, are we on track? Is this the direction that we need to pursue? What's really working? There are so many initiatives, there are so many ideas out there, but how do we know, one, that that works, and two, that that will work for us, even though it may have worked in a different context with a different demographic? So is your reference point the transformation that, a, that individual students are able, because students come into the system from different points, mm -hmm. um, and they have different needs. So it's very difficult to create a, a set milestone that is generic and, and trying to apply that generically to all students just ends up creating unjust, a, 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 a lack of justice. It could also lead to behaviors where you're cherry picking students that require uh, less investment of resource so that you can report success all the time. So is your reference point the journey of the student, how they come in and, and where they leave and and, and how they do academically. How do you, how do you right. create that measurement in a way that is faithful to the mission and to the individual character of individual students? So it's two things. Yes, we do look at the full student academic life cycle, mm -hmm. and we wanna make sure that we understand who is coming in, how we can make sure that we have the right support services in place at key moments in a student's academic life cycle so that they don't fall between the cracks and end up dropping out. So we wanna make sure that we're providing the advising, that we're providing the math support or whatever the need might be for a particular student. But then on the other side, it's also having clear learning outcomes and making sure that we're assessing those learning outcomes because those two have to match. On the one hand, you're right in that if you have learning outcomes that are incredibly fixed, you can have an, an, an inequity that happens. On the other hand, you're, you're also not personalizing outcomes. Right. You want the outcome to be these meaningful and fulfilled purpose-driven lives for each one of the students, regardless of where they begin, which is really was true for me personally. You know, My life as a first-generation and college student was transformed, and as a result, the life of my family was transformed economically and socially in many different ways, and we want that for our students as well. So it has to happen both ways. We have to understand the student and the student needs and make sure that we're not saying you have to be ready for, for the university, but we are a university that is ready for its students 
But then we also have to have clear standards that we're constantly assessing to make sure that we are, in fact, reaching those goals. So how do you approach the students so that you can provide appropriate support but not become a codependent um, right. and dysfunctional <laughs> support relationship? Well, and really, uh, an institution our size, when you're starting to serve nearly 22,000 students, you're almost running a city in 22, many ways. 22,000 students, and then you have your graduate, co uh, your undergraduate core. That's right. How many undergraduates do you have? Undergraduates, we're looking at about 17,000 17,000, so. and then, then the balance of... And then is, is online students, which may attend part-time. But really, if you look at the students that are on our campus mm -hmm. in this sort of micro city, it's 17,000 students. And so at that point, you have to provide services in, at different points. Well, you're, you're running a small you city. You are, you are. And you have, you have to have support services that happen in the residence halls, for mm -hmm. example. So we have resident assistants. We have people that make sure that anything dealing with the living area of the student is being taken care of. Uh, we have health and wellness so that students that are experiencing depression or other issues have a place to go to talk to a counselor and to receive the services that they need. Academically, we have a learning center that provides tutoring in various areas that we have identified as being challenging, as well as coaching, so academic coaching, uh, which helps to guide students. We have our career center that make sure that students are connecting the dots, that it isn't just about going to class, but that they're seeing how these skills that they're achieving are relevant and make them work ready for when they graduate and seek that first opportunity. Uh, what other transformations do you think warrant uh, particular mention? I think front and center, what I hear our alumni say, particularly those that graduated 20, 30 years ago, is how much our campus has changed in terms of the facilities. We have a wonderful new health sciences building that will be opening this summer, starting in the fall. We'll have our students experiencing amazing facilities as part of their learning. And all of that is also meant to help the community in the area of healthcare. How can we create more culturally responsive uh, health providers in our students as they graduate from our university as well. And so that building will just be fascinating. We actually have classrooms that serve as simulations of what it is to take care of patients. And I think that that learning experience is going to be incredible for those students. In addition, we're gonna have a new building for the sciences also coming up in the next five years or so. And so, this is all part of trying to really open up the campus and make it accessible to the community. Our planetarium is a place where community is welcome to attend and they experience the universe within this very fixed space. In addition, our school of uh, music, our school of theater and dance, uh, our art museum, all of these are public spaces that have been transformed in order to be welcoming to the public, to communities, to our students, to schools, the public schools as well. So all of these areas are really that, that connection of what it means to be an engaged university, to be a university that it's open and accessible to the surrounding communities. Well, thank you so much for sharing the work of Ball State University, Provost Susana Rivera Mills, thank you so much for describing this amazing institution and its future, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it.